Thank you. Hi, I'm Adam Yoker, and uh, if you're like me, you've probably grown tired of listening to people from all these companies trying to sell you their brand new codec or trying to sell you their encoder or decoder or this format. Adopt it now, please. <laughs> well, I'm here to present something a little bit different. I'm here to present something made from the same group of people who toil away working on research for codecs in their own spare time. The same group of people which brought you X264. And the same group, and this very same group is still active today and is still going at it as, as, as much as the fans have been seen us. And I know that because uh, I'm the only member who was actually doing any work on it. <laughs> now, I'm here to present a brand new codec which also implies that there's going to be a decoder and an encoder, and indeed there are. And uh, basically, uh, the, the, the title mentions a niche, and this is an important thing. We're not trying to compete with the big one, with the big codecs. We're not trying to compete with the 64 with HBC, with AV1, and uh, VT9. We're trying to fill in the niche that they couldn't because they were too busy or there were too many disagreements between the companies uh, who, were, who were working on the projects. And what is this niche? Well, um, let's, uh, let's go into the, com the, the how, how well w written are the lossless mode implementations for each codec. And as you can see, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, basically, none of them are really as effective as FFD1 is. And FFB1 is a codec which is uh, 15 years old by now. It's almost over the age limit. It can almost have its first ring, but uh, we're hoping to have something good and complete by then. Um, another point which we should take a look at is the main metric used to development. Uh, and indeed, it is a mixed bag here as well, but it's mostly GSNR. And in the case of AV1, it's uh, it's kind of a mixture between PSNR, VMAP, and whatever metric the company uses internally. And uh, there may be even cases where a company has uh, quotas that need to be met, and they're specified as PSNR, so teams have to compete to, to work on improving a PSNR metric, which really harms other metrics as well, but they don't care, because as long as PSNR goes up, their salary might go up, they might get promoted, and uh, they might... Uh, they might see the end of the corporate ladder and become a manager, not doing any code, not doing any research, being dead and empty inside. Um, and finally, how many research codecs are left? None. Dada is, uh, well, not developed anymore because the people who were working on it are working on AV1, and I was lucky enough to join the team right after uh, AV1, right after they started working on AV1. So I've never had the opportunity to work on Dalla, but I did it for free, which makes me uh, part of the elite group of one person who works on codecs for free. Um, and do you really need a reason to work on a research codec other than that you're doing research for the sake of research, which is the only good reason to do any sort of research because you enjoy it? So, the aims of the codec, um, we aim to, uh, if you manage to follow from the previous slide, we want something that has a competitive lossless mode performance, we want something which is optimized for psychovisual optimizations, we want something that's a bit like Opus in that the psychovisual optimizations are part of the codec itself rather than being explicitly signaled. If one does uh, explicit signaling of all of its optimizations. Uh, we also want something that's fast and uh, cheap to implement in software because we are not going to see any implementation of it in hardware except maybe Huawei by one crazy person doing uh, hybrid FPGA and ARM uh, implementation, which is never going to take off, and they're going to leave after they did a 4x4 transform, and that's it. Um, and we want to mostly avoid pay uh, patents. Uh, we cannot do that uh, because part of one of the patents that we really need to break to use the tools that we want to use is to have toggleable uh, lapping and Microsoft holds the patent for that. They patented it in 2003 
and you can blame them for the reason that Lapping hasn't made it into video codecs yet. Actually, you can't blame other companies. Uh, as a reminder, in general, uh, the structure of an encoder or a codec from the, um, the encoder standpoint is that first you do decisions, you do partitioning, you do quantization uh, uh, adjustments, and so on. Then you do filtering of, of frames, then you do transformations, quantizations, and finally you try to remove as many bits from your quantization by having a uh, good entropy coding system. So first of all, the partitioning scheme that we use is something that's a little bit more complicated in AV1. We have a, uh, an index which we send on a per block basis where we say what the node is. Uh, it's a little bit more flexible than AV1 uh, and it's a little bit less efficient but we can reap the benefits from having uh, more flexible uh, partitioning schemes. Uh, another point which uh, unfortunately I can't illustrate here because the projector or the renderer does not do um, gradients, I guess, is that you have lapping, and not laugh, is uh, that you have lapping, which essentially means that uh, your block here in the middle has pixels from this block uh, right through the middle of it, pixels from this block and all the other neighboring blocks. And this essentially breaks locality, but it allows you to completely, almost completely, uh, skip on blocking artifacts, which is the main uh, killer of, of codecs nowadays in terms of perceptual quality. Uh, unfortunately, it does make everything a lot more difficult. It affects the entire codec, and that's one of the reasons why it wasn't explored for inclusion into AV1 and possibly AV2. Um, for transforms, we're using the dollar transforms because there's really no other choice. We worked on uh, the dollar transforms uh, during the AV1 inclusion process. We're a bit bitter about them not making it to AV1, and we're bitter about them not making it to AV2 and AVN plus one. Uh, but uh, hopefully they'll find new life in another codec because they're awesome. They're a bit reversible uh, and uh, they don't need many bits of input and you don't need many bits of, of uh, precision in the intermediaries, uh, which does allow for more efficient uh, SIMD implementations. Um, as for quantization, we are using PBQ because it is the only choice again, because it is exciting, it is new, it is something that has never been done before except Dallas, so we're building on the shoulders of giants and it, uh, it basically has built-in perceptual optimizations in the same way that Opus had them. And if you're unfamiliar with PVQ, you can take a look at my Opus talk last year. But essentially, you have your coefficients, which are uh, L2 normalized. So that means that uh, they're divided by the square root of the sum of the absolute values. Um, additionally, you have the gain, which is needed to restore them back to the amplitude that they had before. And uh, the gain is the main uh, way we optimize quality, which I'll explain later on. And what's left to is to quantize and uh, send the coefficients and the way quantization is done, um, this is directly from my talk uh, last year, is uh, you basically try to approximate uh, these floating point coefficients or these integer coefficients using, uh, using impulses which are filled into a vector which is the same size as the vector that you're trying to, to emulate. And uh, if you think about how it works a little bit and how it approximates, it basically comes down to this, where if you, if you have more impulses, you get a better approximation. And this works differently than scalar quantization in that, um, that your quantizer, your k value, is uh, opposite of what you'd expect, where zero would be the most amount of quality in a scalar quantizer, here k would have to be infinity to produce a identical result to the input vector. Uh, I go into a bit how we theoretically can solve this in the uh, later slides for lossless coding. Uh, the differences with respect to Opus is that k is determined by the quantized gain value, such that it allows us to get a, um, a, an adapt, an adapt an adaptation with respect to the number of bits we get, uh, depending on how much contrast is in a certain vector. So we do implicit bit allocation this way, and this saves us to having to signal a quantizer value, a quantizer delta for scalar quantization, 
which would really help with uh, still image codecs and which wouldn't help that much with uh, video because you would still have to send a quantizer delta if you wanted to have uh, MB3 uh, like algorithms working. Um, so uh, another difference is that while in Opus we had a flat curve uh, throughout the entire coefficients, here we have uh, a, a standard uh, Laplacian distribution, which uh, if, which is Laplacian if we look at the whole block, but if we go down and subdivide the block into bands, we start to see less of it, uh, so we can harvest less of it if we have many bands that we can do prediction in between the bands. Uh, finally, the way it works with, uh, with uh, frequency domain prediction, which is uh, the main selling point, in my opinion, of having PFQ, is uh, that you can do this clever scheme where you you basically cast, um, you transform both your predictor and your uh, your input vector through some process called uh, house color reflection, which does allow you to save bits by having to signal uh, an angle value, which tells you the difference between uh, each of the um, uh, between the vector and the predictor, and it does allow you to save bits if you are able to do. Uh, frequency domain prediction um, efficiently, which I should mention that lapping does not allow you to do. Uh, and indeed, uh, if we take a look at why it happens, lapping reduces locality, especially if you have full lapping, which, which, which is what we're planning to use. Dialo only went as far as to enable lapping on a 4x4 basis in order to simplify block sele selection process. There was a brief experiment where they used heuristics to try to have a better result, but it didn't work. But I believe it can be made to work, which is uh, what is important. Uh, and unfortunately, it isn't a solved problem yet. Uh, you can you can choose to enable lapping uh, fully. You can choose to disable lapping uh, completely or limit it, or you can do directional disabling of lapping if you believe that the patterns on the left and the right side of a block. Uh, would, con would co contaminate the coefficient values you have and not allow you to do uh, prediction. As far as I know, this is covered by a patent of Microsoft, but we don't care. I'm a single guy working on a working on a codec in my free time, toiling away um, doing, doing research. PBQ uh, has faults, of course. It does induce ringing, but that's partly because of uh, the fact that we have lapping. Uh, the ring filter that Dala had. Um, does work efficiently and was indeed merged into AV1 as a potential filter, along with uh, loop restriction, which is what, um, which is something we're a bit bitter about as well. Uh, the plan for Dala to address some of its weaknesses, uh, for instance, in text encoding and low entropy situations, was to use a different transform and use a different quantization method. Uh, we plan to change that a bit by having both. Uh, uh, a, a way to, to uh, use palleted encoding, which does require you to use a different quantization method, as well as uh, trying some other experimental things, because after all, this is a research. Uh, finally, as for entropy coding, uh, well, for now we're using a DALA entropy coder, but we're planning to move to RNS because RNS is faster to do in software, and uh, the main reason. Uh, for moving to RNS is that with lossless coding you have bit rates which are huge and you want uh, the fastest possible decoder uh, you can get and unfortunately FFV1 has a bit of a limitation where if you enable range coder instead of golem you end up in a situation where it takes a long time to decode some a frame and uh, this is due to the entropy coding system uh, giving a bit of a bottleneck. Uh, this work still needs to be done, but uh, I once again I'm working on it. Uh, one experiment which was done, and the reason why it wasn't included in AV1 was because it uh, it uh, wasn't efficient to do um, with respect to encoding, because you had to do an additional operation at the end, which uh, uh, does which did complicate matters for hardware, and uh, they didn't want it. And the experiment which tried to limit uh, how much how heavy the process would be didn't work at all. It was in fact disastrous. So Dallas uh, entropy coder was merged instead. Uh, finally, as for lossless uh, coding, right now there aren't really much plans because 
well, it's much more exciting to work on lossy, lossy encoding than lossless, but the plan is to eventually try to use a mixture of uh, old methods and new methods in order to try to improve uh, performance as well as compression. <coughs> Uh, one thing I should mention is that DCTs are generally very good for lossless compression if your DCT is reversible and you have, for instance, a, a, uh, a constant DC value across the entire clock because you just need to send one value, one coefficient, and uh, with a bit of modifications, shifts, and so on, you will get a complete output in much less time than having to send a whole bunch of uh, relevant length encoded blocks. Uh, there are quite a few things left to do, but once again, I'm working on it. Uh, the DSP is fully complete. Uh, it is looking quite nice. It is quite performant. A lot of the code of data has been rewritten to look better and work better. The lapping filter was completely uh, was completely made using macros, so you don't have a, a lot of heavy code to do um, to to have custom functions for each one of them. Uh, there is logic to, to full lapping uh, on uh, any block basis, but it's a bit buggy at the moment, so it's not enabled. Uh, PBQ is currently in progress, uh, which um, well, I'm halfway through um, completing. Um, RNS hasn't been started yet, but it will have to be finished because you generally want to have a complete entry code system before you have quantization done because the, the, the way, the, the way uh, entropy coding system works is that it tries to harvest as many bits from an optimal method of quantization as possible. Uh, and finally, RDO, which is going to be the very last thing probably to do, uh, and, and it will take a long time. Uh, there is a Git repo up here. I'm working on it. <coughs> Commits usually appear once in a while. It works. You can test it. It's a it's quite fast at the moment, but that's because it doesn't do much. All right, <coughs> that's the end of my talk. <laughs> I'll take questions now. Yep. Uh, I'm a bit confused by the name. Uh, shouldn't you have called it Dollar Two? Uh, FFV2? Uh, actually, the original net, but, right. So the question is, why is it named FFV2? Should well, the original name of the project was FAB2 Slart Dala, and indeed it is the same in the Git repository. I still haven't settled on a name, but FAB2 sounds fine, so I think I'll continue to use it until someone plays it and claims it. So, um, your um, pitch for a niche place because that this is a lossless code. A lossless codec and a um, and something which optimizes. Right, so that so at the same time, a lot of the things that you're talking about here, like um, you know, optimizing for precise visual distortion, which means not lossless, or things like quantization and coding where we need infinite bits for lossless, right? So something again which is not lossless. It seems that many of the features that you're talking about specifically imply um, no lossless use cases also. So can you talk about this a little bit? Right? Uh, right. So your question is, isn't this a uh, a lossless codec? And the answer is no. Did you take a look at the first slide? I put it right there. It's it's trying to fill the in the niche, which is both the fact that modern codecs do not do lossless well, and the fact that modern codecs do not do psychovisual optimization implicitly well. So so it's a bit of both. And as far as for use cases, you generally want the maximum amount of speed in lossless mode, as well as compression, which is somewhat decent. Right, uh, no other questions. So uh, thank you very much for listening.